It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Richard Fox, Jim Meehan with you for a half hour or so. After another big weekend for the Zags, they took care of business in Salt Lake City. Uh, easy win over Mc, McNeese State, easy win over Kansas. On to the Sweet 16 in Detroit, where they will face the Purdue Boilermakers, a team they have ran into a few times the last two years with uh, without good results, but we'll see this time around. Uh, Foxy, the, the Zags are, are pretty decent dancers, I would say at this point. <laughs> They're, that's nine years in a row to the Sweet 16. I don't think there's anybody even close to that nationally. That's 15 straight first round wins, if my memory's right. The last loss was Steph Curry at Davidson. Oh, wow, whatever, really? Whatever year that was, 08 ish, 90 I, 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 I called that game on the radio. <laughs> I watched that game. I watched all those. Uh, I think he had 40, maybe, in yeah, that game. Yeah. A bunch of threes. Stephen Gray hit a bunch of threes uh, and played uh, very well, but uh, not enough that day. Um, you know, it's it's the 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 Sweet Sixteens is is almost more impressive than the. <laughs> I mean, they're both impressive, but you know, you're not playing. You can't fake it your way into a sweet 16 you're gonna play somebody i don't care if you're a one seed or a you know a two or a three any of those at worst you're gonna play maybe an eight or a nine and it's a power conference team that's battle tested zags have played all kinds of those along the way um but hey we're smart guys we both picked them to go to the sweet 16 yeah, last week obviously. like nothing nobody's business you know we know uh but no i couldn't have foreseen the Dom, I mean, two 21 point wins. I, I didn't see one 21 point win coming. That's that's what really uh, surprised me watching it unfold. What about you? Yeah, I think you you, you make a great point there about just you know, how impressive it is. And you're absolutely right. There are no these these second round games are getting more and more difficult. Um, I think it's Gonzaga certainly made it look easy over the weekend, but over the, the nine year stretch, there have been some real nail biters and. Um, it's just remarkable to see them. I think they're on, is it Duke and Carolina or maybe Kansas? I can't remember the other, the other two teams, but uh, it's pretty rarefied air for this program at this point. It's going to be uh, very interesting whenever this 316 run comes to an end, how folks react, but let's enjoy it while it's happening. I know it's supposed to end. That's what everybody was saying two months ago. So yep. <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, all those pundits and, and the media and alike, uh, not always correct. So let's uh, let's move on. The week that was, McNeese State opening round team that had uh, won thirty games, uh, not a ton of turn tournament experience, but some pretty impressive numbers. I mean, they <laughs> they didn't have a lot of close wins on their way to thirty. Uh, they were beating people pretty good. I think their average margin was maybe nineteen points a game. They were very good defensively, even though they lacked size. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 39 points a game, they are 39 percent shooting a game. They allow are uh, 61 ish on the point totals per game. I mean, those are St. Mary's type numbers, and they're not playing slow down. They're uh, they're willing to go up and down the floor, but the way they do it with that smaller lineup, especially when they're facing the Gonzaga team with three bigs, is to you know try to rattle them. They they pressed on the first you know series of the game. Gonzaga broke it, hit a three ball. Uh, they they tried to double the post all the time, and Anton started racking up assists. The three ball almost opened up <laughs> the inside game uh, for a bit because they kept getting great looks. They weren't able to recover after they double. They were just flying around trying to catch up to shooters, and it, it wasn't possible. So I think uh, the Zags, it felt like to me they knew it was coming. They were always a step ahead. They were perfectly scouted. And – you know, really, after the pressure didn't have an impact, there was no plan B. There, there was no, right. well, we'll try this, and <laughs> this might slow them down. The only time they slowed down was at the very end when uh, some walk-ons and, and some, they went to their bench. Uh, and they could have scored as many as they wanted if, if that game had stayed close. What would you see? 
Yeah, look, that's a really good, I mean, East State, I mean, 2.1 over 30 games, you know, eventually dominated throughout the course of the year. Um, you know, n- number five scoring defense, at least statistically in the country, holding teams to under 62 points. Gonzaga, 86 to your point, probably could have had 110 had they wanted to. Um, top 10 in force and turnovers is McNeese State, Gonzaga with four. I, I just thought it, to, I think that's a really good point that that Gonzaga just looked as if they knew it was coming. Really well scouted. Um, we're not surprised with the pressure, the speed, both EK and Watson were ready for double teams and made the right decision. They almost as if they knew where to go with the ball based on the rotations of McNeese. Yeah. So just a complete, you know, uh, a dominant performance, uh, on both ends. You saw the, the, the advantage of playing big really stood out. Um, I thought Nemhard was just in complete control of that game, you know, nine assists, uh, only three turnovers, but really just the way he, he never let McNeese speed up Gonzaga. Watson obviously was incredible, almost a triple double, you know, one, one assist shy of that. And, you know, we talked about it last week. You know, I, I thought it was going to be a game for Dusty Stromer, and boy, was it. I mean, that first half he put together, I think Greg got in some foul trouble, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. They, they came in, ended up playing 30 minutes, 10 points, I think all of that in the first half. Um, three assists, only one turnover was just really, really solid, looked really comfortable. Um, and, you know, this is what it's going to be. You know, in, in these tournament games with injuries or foul troubles, you know, whatever the case might be, you don't know who you're going to have calling on, but for Gonzaga, you know, it's going to be Stromer and Huff. One or two. Um, yeah. Yeah. You hope you hope you don't get, get to a Houston situation and, that we saw last night. I don't know if you watched that game. Oh, my God. Uh, but, you know, we've got a walk on who's played in you know, a handful of games in the year trying to make a free throw. But um, I thought Dusty was was awesome. Just looked really comfortable. And, and, you know, Luca got a really short stretch there in the first half. I thought that was important. Just you're not having to play. Nemhard and Hickman, you know, the entirety of that first 35, you know, 25, 30 minutes, you know, understanding you got a game in less than 48 hours. You know, all of it adds up and matters. Uh, and I thought Huff was also good off the bench. So I'm not sure there's much to say. Obviously, the higher seed is Gonzaga. They played that way. I thought the approach over the weekend, obviously, was tremendous. We can touch on that after, well, yeah. as, as we talk about the Kansas uh, game. But all in all, just a, a, a great opening round performance, a team that looked really, you know, prepared to play right mindset and just overwhelm McNeese. And not just, you know, on the offensive end with the doubles and all that, mm-hmm. the defensive end was also, uh, they were, they were wired perfectly there. They were dialed in the, the, the Shahada Woods, uh, Wells, I'm sorry, Shahada Wells, uh, very good player, strong, quick, fast, pull up, get to the rim. I mean, he aggressive, uh, good score all through the year. Uh, they had a uh, kind of an undersized four man shoemate. Mm-hmm. Man, that kid is Brandon Clark bouncy, and and you can't play harder <laughs> as a human than that kid did. And he he did some damage, but the Zags did exactly what they try to do with a lot of these premier guards. They might get their points, and I think what um, Shahada Wells had nineteen. Yeah, it was six of twenty five. 20, yeah, twenty five shots to get there. Yeah, and, six and, to twenty-five. And what you hear with them is, you know, just want them to see a lot of eyes on the drive. You know, if they can dig in, if the big can help, all those things, and I, they could in that situation. Their bigs could help without getting, uh, you know, damaged elsewhere. Other than Shoemate, he was the one constant for McNeese. So uh, everybody will talk about the, all the assists and how they diced up the the McNeese defense, one of the top in the country. I thought defensively it was almost as impressive and until it got away and that they got up 30 and again, the, the margin came down. Uh, one other thing, you know, Mark few always gets criticized for leaving his starters in too long in blowouts. <laughs> well, he pulled Anton out for 50 something in there left in the game. He's sitting with nine assists, needs the one to, to break, uh, become the first triple double in GU history in an NCAA tournament game. And so that's the counter for, uh, 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 as Anton told me, yes, I did want to try to get it. I did want to be out there, but the coaches want me to be healthy for the next round. So uh, the plus and minus, if you play those starters, you risk injury, you risk, you know, a 25 point game, you might lose a guy to an ankle injury, something like that. And that happened in a game I was watching. It was a blowout. 
and there were still starters out there. And, it, and it, it, it's not wasn't anything serious, but a kid, one of their starters limped off three minutes left in a 25 point game. And I'm thinking, got to get him out. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. But anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there, but you, you know, you know, all the stuff Mark always gets, uh, um, criticized for well this was a case where he was probably uh you know trying to make sure that he didn't have his main guy in a lot of ways uh get injured so maybe another day for anton to to try to to get that triple double so let's move on to kansas and just watching that court side and watching that first half just how high level things were going offensively both teams i mean shooting it moving it scoring pretty uh, pretty efficiently it was uh, i think i tweeted out the uh, the old gladiator line are you not entertained because it was <laughs> highest of high levels uh, offensively made me wonder uh who's gonna find a defensive answer and, and that came in the second half the zags uh, that run they put out in the second half uh they've done that they did that against san francisco a time or two they've done it against you know lower level opponents uh, that was Kansas, and I know Kansas was beat up on the other side, but they were higher ranked, uh, seated, I should say. They've still got some pros playing. Uh, they've still got All-American recruits, you know, you know McDonald's All-American kids. Uh, what did Zags do to, to get a hold of that Kansas offense other than, look, Kansas was gassed. Everybody knows it. They've had a rough go. So are the Zags. Zags don't go deep. They, they play seven guys, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. They had the benefit of playing a couple hours earlier than Kansas on Thursday, but it's not like they're running nine, 10 guys through and can bend and, and sub, you know, people in and out and get rest. What did the Zags do to call her the, the Jayhawks in the second half? Well, I mean, I, I just think they overwhelmed them on the offensive end more than anything. Uh, I mean, nearly doubled up, up Kansas, 46 points for Gonzaga, 24 for KU in the second half. Gonzaga shoots 67 percent, KU 28. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that had to do I mean, I, a lot of that had to do with where Kansas was, in my opinion, with respect to their, their leg, their depth. Um, and that team just really limped into the tournament in a lot of ways. Um, but I just think they, you know, the Gonzaga's ability to that, the start of that run forced, I think, Kansas to play faster than they wanted to. I think Gonzaga did a good job of getting the ball out of Dickinson's hands. I mean, even when he had it, he just didn't have the same level of pop or, or, or strength that he normally does. And Graham's, a, uh, you know, a, Graham struggled with fouls again. But when Graham was was able to be on the floor, he matches up pretty well with with Dickinson with respect to strength. He's only given up four, it looks like four inches on TV. I don't know what it looked like in person, but he's got a lower center of gravity, He's got uh, the same level of strength. And I thought, you know, that's not something that, that Dickinson's going to face every day. And I think given some of the wear, the wear and tear that he's probably feeling. And I thought they forced other guys to have to make plays, you know, Furphy, Timberlake, those types of players. And they're, they're just not capable of doing that. And the, the way this, the speed in which Gonzaga played, I think really created problems for Kansas. Kansas wasn't trying to play fast on Saturday. You know, they really wanted to slow it down. Um, and sometimes that happens. I mean, sometimes you get going, get rolling offensively, and it can help you defensively. It, it forces the team to play faster than they might want to. Um, you know, they're looking at the, the the time and score. You know, taking shots they may not normally take. But um, I, I just think you saw Gonzaga's quality um, and their confidence. It's about as well as they played offensively all year. Just the way they yeah. moved the ball, the shots they made. Yeah, it was, it was awfully impressive. Yeah, and to the to the point about the exhaustion and running on fumes, uh, there was a stretch there. It seemed like six or seven shots in a row. Every shot Kansas put up was short. Every one, mm-hmm. front iron, front iron, front iron. The Furphy, uh, Timberlake, Dickinson had one short. Uh, so that's true. There, and Bill Self said something in the post game that you don't hear very often. He's and he admitted. You don't hear this very often. Is he? You got some guys out. He went to him and said, hey, "I need you back." You know, I think yeah. it was one of the And he said, "I need a little more time." The, the player told him that. I mean, that just tells you how how uh, gassed they were. But uh, one of the reasons they were gassed is I thought Gonzaga's offensive approach, much like with uh, Kentucky, that game where 
uh, Nemhard was um, a maestro again, uh, and they were, you know, hell bent on trying to get Dickinson to move and move out of his comfort zone and try to have to deal with, uh, um, you know, a screen and a roll and all those things. And then the other kid too, Adams, the the power yeah. forward, I think, was in that in that action as well. Uh, and just play after play, uh, Gonzaga getting what they wanted with Nemhard just running it all. I mean, he's uh, Andrew was exceptional. Andrew Nemhard was exceptional on pick and roll. He had the great size that you know that uh, Ryan six foot, Andrew six five. But those two are just like conductors. Uh, and Ryan, I think, is actually getting better if, <laughs> if that's possible because they're doing it against good people, uh, quality opponents. Uh, how did they just just make uh, Dickinson and company uncomfortable with what they're doing on on their offensive actions? Well, look, the Nembar brothers are the best Gonzaga's ever had at the pick and roll. Um, I mean, it's not close. Yeah. You know, there are yeah. guys who you know point guards and, and guards who've been able to do that, but it's not close. It, it's really a gift. They they just have an ability to um, to play off that action in a way that Gonzaga. I mean, they, they quite frankly. Their pros, their NBA pros, when it comes to pick and roll action, they, they, you know, Ryan has other deficiencies in his game that may not make, you know, allow him to play in the NBA. But from that one skill set, they're NBA caliber, um, and you just see it with Ryan. I mean, and you know, to your point about Dickinson, that's a great uh, observation. Something we'll talk about here when we get into the Purdue game is forcing Dickinson out on the perimeter, and more importantly, you know, when you attack a big like Dickinson and Edie that we'll talk about, uh, Edie in particular, but you know, Dickinson's a really good shot blocker. You know, For a guy as tall as he is, and both Edie and Dickinson play a little bit upright, you know, they're, they're, you don't ever look at them and say, boy, those guys are in a stance. You know, but they're just so long, strong, big, and they've got good feet, so they can kind of, even if a guard starts to get by them, they've got the ability to recover and block the shot high. I thought Nemhard did a good job of not forcing those on the drive, and almost what happens is you create a switch on the back end because Dickinson has to stay long enough. And now you've got a mismatch where it's either, you know, EK Watson with a small on him, or you make one pass and now you've got Huff was open underneath you know, on, on that one play in the second half. Um, that's going to be really important in the Purdue game is you can't, when you, when you have Edie in a pick and roll and you start attacking the basket, you think you've got to drive, you don't. Yeah. That's right. So don't you're not actually coming off that screen to score. You're coming off that screen to force a rotation or a mismatch. Yeah, somewhere he slows else on the floor. down to keep him occupied, right? Yes, exactly. He he he's, he slows his speed so Dickinson has no choice but to stay with him. Yeah, it's just it's a master class, honestly. <laughs> um, yes. So you know, I think that's something to watch. But um, again, the freshmen were great. So, you know, Huff, much like Kentucky, felt very comfortable. Uh, he played 18 minutes. They were meaningful uh, in, the, in the first half when, with EK with some foul trouble early in the second half. You know, 11 points, four of nine from the field. You know, the Dusty, I thought, was solid. No turnovers, made a shot, but 15 minutes, just solid. I know some of those came late. You know, Watson, again, was tremendous, but... You know the 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 one th the one thing I I noticed if you know as we kind of transition to what's what's moving ahead is Gonzaga can't afford to miss some of the bunnies they missed even in the second half against Kansas. You've got to take advantage of those shots inside. I thought Huff four of nine. I, I loved his approach. I thought he held up defensively. He had the one mistake uh, which I thought was interesting. He and Stromer were in action together. Yep. And I think I think Braden thought they were going to switch. It was kind of a dribble handoff. Uh, I'm guessing the game plan was not to have Dusty switch, switch on to Dickinson, and he had a layup, right? Yeah. It felt like it was the slowest moving layup I've ever seen a guy make. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than that, I thought Dusty competed against Dickinson. I mean, uh, 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 pardon me, Braden. I mean, he certainly doesn't have the size or strength, but his activity level was good. Um, but, you know, look, uh, just to wrap it up, I guess, on, on my thoughts on, on the Kansas game, um, it's remarkable to me. We've talked about the lack of depth all year for this group. And you get to the second round and Gonzaga looks fresh. Yeah. And Kansas has a lot of the same struggles, probably more pronounced, and they're gassed. Now, yeah. that's a big, you know, there's lots of reasons as to why they play in the Big 12, this, that, this, that, and the other. They have, they have proper injuries and all that. But um, 
I don't know if I would have called that. I, I I felt like this team was going to wear down at some point, and they just haven't. I mean, I know, and I, and I know, I know Greg is struggling with some stuff, but I, but he's just a warrior, right? But other than that, I mean, on balance, they're pretty healthy. Hey, man, how many minutes, you know, of this podcast in November, December, January, did we spend, you know, got to find a way to get guys in, got to get them yeah. hard time, got to get Nolan out, got to get Anton out. There's no way they're going to hold up for the for a season. They can't avoid injury or they're just going to be without legs. They look – and one thing, with Dusty especially, getting those minutes. Nemhart and Hickman, I believe, got breaks in each of the first halves. They did. I think that's enormous. And if they time it right, which they know what they're doing, they time it with the TV timeout coming. Or which, are longer, which are longer. Which are longer. Forever. Right? Trust me, as a deadline guy. <laughs> so really, those just the minutes those guys are giving them, and they're good minutes, are I, – I was worried about Huff, man. When Dickinson was posting, he is as big as the doorway. Okay? He is that big. And he has hands. The ball yes. touches his hands. It is like Velcro. But when he posts, he has the – and it's neck high. On, on yeah. <laughs> and about two or three times it was just sitting there. He wasn't popping it or anything, but I thought, man, if he wheels around, Braden's going to go into the fifth row with a <laughs> concussion. He, uh, but that's how he, he just has that right under his neck. And it just uh, – he's thinking, oh, man, I wouldn't want to be Braden right now. That's a, it's a big man who could do some damage. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, we've got uh, – Next segment will be on Purdue here because um, we saw uh, the Zags saw Purdue in Honolulu. Uh, saw them last year in Portland, if I remember right. Outcome right. very similar. Uh, could not deal with, with Edie. Could not deal with the supporting cast. I think that gets very lost in, in this picture of why Purdue is so good. Uh, the, this guy, I mean, if you think Dickinson's big, this guy, he's not as wide maybe. But he is, he's every bit of 7'4". I don't, did they listen to 7'4 yeah. or 5? I believe I mean, so. Yeah, 7'4. And has just gotten better every year. Uh, you know, he scores over both shoulders. You When he posts, you know, you look at whoever's behind him, and if they're 6'9 or 10, they look like they're in grade school. I mean, he's just that big. Uh, so that's, you know, the, the top line of the scout. What do you do with Edie that's different than the times before? Um, now before we get to all that, I will say, I mean, if you watch Gonzaga now versus November, uh, you wouldn't know it unless the Jersey said the same name, the way they're playing now versus then is completely different. I think Purdue's playing a little different too. I think Edie has gotten better and better about when to try to make my move, when the doubles come and he's more aware of it. And he doesn't get a ton of assists sometimes, but he gets the hockey assist. He gets the pass yeah. to the pass as that guy's trying to recover and leaves the next one open. Uh, I think he's gotten better. And and uh, so, anyway, option uh, – uh, job one is Edie. Zags obviously have tried multiple guys on him, different ways on him. What do you expect to see this time? And is there really truly a way to, to keep this yeah. guy somewhat under his averages? Well, let, let's look back to the, the game in Maui. Gonzaga's up five in the first half. And, you know, Gonzaga just could not buy a bucket from three, uh, six of 32. Almost half Gonzaga's shots came from three. That has a lot to do with Edie's size and, and the deterrence he is around the rim. But I think if we look, think back on that on Gonzaga to start this year, it felt like they were three-point happy at times. Um, and I think still figure out how they wanted to play. And obviously the, the, the non-conference shooting percentages were awfully low with respect to how things have been in the new year here in 2024. Only 13 assists and 14 turnovers for Gonzaga in that game. You know, Gonzaga shot under 33%, 6 of 32 from 3, as I mentioned. Only got to the line eight times. Um, versus Purdue shot 47%, didn't shoot the ball well from 3, 4 of 17, but got to the line 16 times in that game. You know, Edie's uh, 25 points, 14 rebounds, five of those offensive, but only eight of 16 from the field. Now, I say only, even though that's 50%, because he's yeah, been shooting yeah. eight of 11, you know, 11 of 13 in these games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he getting to the line, he got to the line, it was nine of 10 against Gonzaga. He drew seven fouls. Um, you know, 
How do you stop what will, a guy who's going to end up being the two-time player of the year in college? Um, not, only do, not, only, not only am I not paid to do that, make that decision, I'm probably not qualified, but nonetheless, I'll take a stab at it. I think it, for, for Purdue, it's about the others. Yeah. You know, they've got five guys in, in, in Lawyer, Smith, Heaney, who's been really good, Cameron Heaney, the, the freshman, yeah. Gillis, and Coleman, another freshman. They all shoot, all of them shoot over 44% from three. That's what kills you against Purdue. If those guys not only, you know, it's not that just that they can shoot it, but they get wide open looks with Edie. So, you know, you, you can't, you know, and I should have, we should have gone back and listened to our podcast going into Maui. I'm sure we had a thought on this, but I yeah, may be being redundant or Connor contradicting myself, but you have to change it up with Edie. But I think you've got to let him go. If he, if he eats, if he gets going, fine. Like if he goes for 35, the other ones? fine. I do not want to let these other guys get going, right? Because it, it's the snowball effect for Purdue. If all these others, these role guys, get going from three, it's impossible to beat them, in my opinion. Because Edie's always there. He's even a bad night for Edie's a double double, eighteen points and thirteen rebounds. So you can't give him single coverage the whole time. I, I think you have to to change it up. But on balance, I, I think I'd stay attached to shooters. You know, they're going to put out a guy or two occasionally that doesn't stroke it well. That may be your opportunity to to, to double. I would never double from the strong side. He's so good. He, and, he, you know, if, and when I say strong side, if he's if he's on the right block and there's a Gonzaga perimeter player, you know, on his side of the ball, you can't double with that guy. He just right over the top, throws it out, and either that guy gets a shot or now you're playing from behind with your rotations. But you can dig, force him to pick it up, and then recover. And then if you're going to double, I think you have to change it where it's coming from, whether it be big to big on the weak side. But I, I would not live that way defensively. I, I really think I would I, I would look at Huff, Greg, and, uh, and Ike and say, boys, do your work early, meet him, force him to shoot over, your, over the body. I try to force him over his right shoulder, meaning away from his right-hand jump hook as much as I could. And he's going to score. Do not get d- discouraged. If he scores, he scores. Let's try to force him to make shots over a body and don't foul him because he's automatic from the line. He was nine of ten against against Gonzaga, uh, against Utah State. He was seven of, uh, of eight. So, you know that that's where I would start with things. Is is just you know I I just think I let Edie go do his thing, and then on the the offensive side of the ball, that's to me where Gonzaga has to. I mean, I put him in thirty pick and rolls. I, I what and I and I know that they're not going to do this because it, it's such a dramatic change, but you know maybe you don't go all the way with it. But I'd almost look at it like an NBA deal. We've got maybe the one of the best pick and roll point guards in the country. We've got bigs who can all score. We're just going to end up we're either right away in a position possession, or shortly after we get into our action, we're going high pick and roll center of the center of the floor with Edie. And if it doesn't work, yeah. we're going to bring it back out and we're going to do it again. I'd, I mean, that would be something to count during the game. How many pick and rolls is Edie involved with? Because what happens is, to my point earlier about Dickinson, you you may not score off that initial action, but now you forced a rotation. All of a sudden, Edie's, you know, either having to stay with Nemhard or Hickman, or he's, you know, turning around trying to figure out where his guy is, and you might be able to find – good opportunities so and i think that patience offensively too you don't want to shoot half your shots from three you want to find a way to get to the basket but if you force Edie to move either you know with swinging the ball pick and rolls you're going to have more opportunities to attack the basket yeah i mean you're right i, I think their I, I think their strategy is going to lean more towards let zach eat not let him eat but if he eats starve the rest more or less. Yes. You know, if if Edie gets 28, let's keep the other seven in their rotation to, you know, 40 or less. Keep them in the 60s somehow, total. Yeah, you 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 can't have Kaufman Rain go for 18 points like he did against Utah State. You can't that that's a that's a backbreaker, right? Braden Smith and Lance Jones are two guards are smaller. I think you can speed them up. But at the same time, what I don't want to do is I, I don't want to get so up into them defensively that now they, they get by me and now we're rotating and they're throwing it up top to to Gillis, to 
to ED. I, I, I want to keep those guys in front and force those guys to have to make plays. The more the ball's in other people's hands, the better I'm going to feel, I think, offense, defensively. And Smith is a guy that has killed the Zags. I mean, he's yeah. at the three. He just runs it so smart. You know, if he's got three or four threes, that's danger zone. If Lawyer hits a couple, it, Jones, you know. Uh, that one thing I will say, Edie and Dickinson to some degree, they are going to be reluctant to come out. You see them come out and they got a foot outside the free throw line and they're still – you know, trying to, to be the paint protector and they don't, they know they don't want to be out there. It's like right. the, Drew Timmy didn't want to be out there and, and Shemek didn't want, you know, uh, but if the further out they can get, you know, and you were right, even if it's not that, um, you know, that may, that maybe EB stay, Edie stays with Nemhard for a second. I mean, think about if there's an offensive rebound ahead and he's 12 feet from the rim, you know, that's, that's where you could hurt him too. If you can occupy him out there, at least just 10, 12 feet away from the rim, right. uh, that could be and, uh, very and, helpful. But. And, and, and Mark Few told me this once, and he probably did it because I didn't jump very high and I get my shot blocked from time to time. But he told me the most overrated play in basketball is the block shot. Well, and if you think about it, he's right. I mean, more often than not, I get I, we get the ball back. You know, yeah. it, it's not like a steal where there's a change in possession. A guy blocks a shot, it goes out of bounds, or the guy whose shot gets blocked gets it, or it's a loose ball, whatever the case might be. You, Zach Eady is going to get four or five blocks. Deal with it. We're just going to – so when we have a lane, we're going to attack the rim. Like, you have to go to dunk it. If you're if you're Stromer, Greg, Watson, all these guys – I mean, obviously, Hickman and, 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 and uh, Nemhard don't play that way. You have to go at Eady. So, you, you know, these layups, I mean, I, I was watching Utah State. I mean, these guards would get in the middle of the lane. It'd be this little floater or kind of trying to shoot around him. And he would, it's like he's playing volleyball. Yeah. I have to attack him, attack his body. Um, I can't be worried about getting my shot blocked. It, it's yeah. it's just, it's going to happen with a guy this big and this long. So if I, if I kind of let go of that apprehension, that fear that I'm going to have my shot blocked, I'm going to be way more effective as a player. Yeah. And I, I, I would imagine that's part of the conversation is when we do have those situations where we've turned a corner and, and Edie's either trailing the play or coming over, yeah, yeah. It, you know, th these little cute floaters don't really work. You know, it, it, we've got, you got to go right to the rim and create a situation where an official has to make a decision. There's contact at the rim. And, you know, unfortunately, usually the smaller guy gets the benefit of the doubt. So can Gonzaga find a way to, to pin, particularly in that first half, a couple fouls on Edie by that 10 or 12 minute mark and have a, a stretch there where he's not a factor. Because I do think if you take Edie, this is not, this is not rocket science. If you take Zach Edie and replace him with an average college center, I think Gonzaga is better by a mile on balance, right? He's the difference. So if you can pin a couple fouls on him in the first half, you know, again, a halfway mark or 12, 13 minutes into the first half and you have that run, that stretch of time where he's not on the floor and you could take advantage, that might be a huge part of the difference yeah. at the end of the game. Last thing I'll say is the teams are not what they were in November, obviously both ways. Zag's even more extreme. They're, they're playing exceptionally right now at both ends. But Purdue does have one thing going that lost in the first round last year and, you, and how they have responded already in this tournament. You know, a little little bumpy at the outset of their opener, but took care of that. And they beat a that's a dang good Utah State team. I've really watched good them team. play a lot. And what was it, forty? I mean, they yeah, they have that good. Virginia thing the year after they lost the first game. They have that in their heads. This it's all the way. We are not. I mean, they are playing with a, a chip themselves. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, obviously, beating Gonzaga head to head a couple of times is going to give them great confidence, good feeling going in. But I think beyond that is is that back of their head, we lost to one sixteen last year, took grief for a year, and we're here to to make this right. So different motivations uh, on these sidelines, but uh, both at the same end goal. A couple of general topics, and we'll get out of here. Um, wanted to talk about <clears throat> Mark Few and the job he's done. Has to be one of his sweetest sixteens. Instead, I'm going to write about that here in a day or two. So we'll pick up the review in a couple of days. You'll see it. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> and and uh, I don't think anybody would quibble 
what where they came from to where they are now uh it, it's uh, it's got to be one of his better jobs let's go on to to two topics ben greg i talked to him yeah. after the game he's a walking bruise he's limping he's He's got the ankle thing. I think both of his legs got rolled into like an offensive lineman in football guy coming from behind and, and ran, rolled into him. And he went off and came back in. He is, uh, he is very close friends with Josh Therian right now. The trainer is uh, working around the <laughs> clock to, to get him right. But he just has that mind over matter deal where uh, I, it's not going to stop me. Not going to, I'm going to do what I do. Uh, you know, and even uh, Matt Painter in his post game interview mentioned how different the Zags are because they're playing those three bigs now all the time. You know, something me Foxy had you know months ago uh, thrown out there. So, uh, what do you make of Ben Gregg beyond the stat line? If he gets six points or 15 points, there it's not easy to measure just how important he is. Uh, what do you make of a guy? playing with you know with every bone and muscle in his body barking at him man i'm just pausing because um well for one i I know what it's like to play in pain um and it's you know it's funny you there gets to a point where the pain you kind of become accustomed to the pain but it's the mental fatigue of knowing you're going to be in pain every time you play so that ramp up in your mind to get ready for a game when you know it's going to hurt, that's, to me, the hardest part. You know, oddly enough, kind of you, you learn, you, you get to a point where you can manage that pain. Um, but if there's just something you just know it's going to hurt and then you might get hurt. It might start hurting even worse than what you're used to. So uh, I, I just don't think you can say enough about Ben and um, what he's meant to this group this year i mean that would be an interesting exercise to go back during mark's time to see how many guys um have had the impact uh, an impact similar to what ben has had this year for this group once he's been inserted in the starting lineup um or or even just a a guy who wasn't playing but then started playing you know i I think joel ayayi comes to mind that joel and and andrew when andrew went into the starting lineup yeah for Um, but Yeah, it, it's just, it, it's, it, and I think you and I were there. I think it was Pepperdine was that his first start. Yep, it was. Uh, I had that game, and obviously you were down there covering it, and you could feel it immediately, the difference in having him on the floor. You know, he's a kid who wanted to be a Zag for probably as long as he could remember. Um, that 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 passion, I think, for being a Gonzaga, and it means a lot to him. You You can tell. Uh, I mean, that San Diego, San Diego game that same weekend, he hurts his back and he's not coming out of the game. Oh. He is not going to give up this opportunity. Uh, and this is a guy who's been here for a while now. I mean, people forget, I think, that he came over uh, because of the COVID situation, no high school season. So yep. he's on that team that I think lost to Baylor, uh, if I remember, remember, remember yep, correctly. Yep. Team, yeah. you know, I don't that doesn't play that year, but he's around all those guys. And he's really had to pay his dues. And... Um, you know, it's just been, I, I don't, I, I think it says a lot about his character, the journey he's he's had to kind of finally get the opportunity and his uh, stubbornness in not letting go of his spot. And you cannot overstate, I don't, I don't think you can overstate what he's meant to this group this year. Um, you know, not only, you know, it's one thing to make the change. It's another thing, is the guy going to take advantage of it and actually have the impact? And he's done both of those things. If Ben Gregg doesn't play the way he's, he's played, this is not, we're not, this podcast ended two weeks ago. Yeah, you're right. Which has taken money out of our paychecks. So, yeah. come on, man. <laughs> hey, that, that, is, that, is, that, is that one meal at the Red Iguana? You, I haven't got the update yet. Did, oh, did, did the, the podcast update. pay for the one meal? One meal at the Red Iguana. Fabulous, of course. Just didn't work out timing of the games and all that, but uh, Red Iguana, unbeaten, unbeaten. Just can't have a bad <laughs> meal there. All right, Foxy, we're gonna do. We're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna make a prediction. We're gonna, you know, put ourselves okay. out there on the limb again, like we always do. The people need to need to hear it. They expect it. Uh, I'll go first. Purdue uh, coming up. I don't think it's gonna be like the other two games. Uh, I think it is gonna be a down to the wire game. Uh, the other games were 10, 15, well, I think in Portland, it might've been 18 or 19. 
Uh, I do think it's going to be closer. I do think the Zags will have some answers. I am going to stick with my prediction, Sweet 16 at the start of the year and at the start of the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think uh, I think Purdue comes on out on top. I won't even blink twice if the Zags win that game. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a classic, and I think it's coming down to the last 30 seconds. What do you got? Uh, I, I felt that way, and I kind of this morning digging into, into my thoughts on the game. Uh, I think Gonzaga gets Purdue, loses in the lead eight. Oh. I, 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 I do. I, and I, I felt I was with you uh, all the way up until this morning. But like, like I said, I was trying, getting ready for the pod and, and looking back on the game and, and, and kind of where these teams are at. Um, Purdue certainly has a, a real motivation after how last year kind of you know imploded on them in the first round. And they, they are playing really, really well. This is just a completely different Gonzaga team, and this team has its own chip. Um, I, I love the way that they're playing together. Um, I think they're going to find a way to, 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 you know, contain the ED effect, you know, on both ends. He's going to have a great game. Um, but I think Gonzaga's others are better. You know, I, I, you're, you're going to need to pitch almost a perfect game, but I think they've got one more in them. Okay. Um, but I, I, I don't uh, – I'd be hard pressed to see them. I think it's going to take everything that they have if they win that game. I, I'm hard pressed to believe they're going to have enough to be either a very, very good Creighton team or a very, very good Tennessee team. But um, I think next week we're going to probably prep a little bit and try to figure out who's coming <laughs> in next year. But um, I do think we'll have a win to talk about. Well, win or lose, uh, we will be back next Monday. Uh, always enjoy it, uh, Foxy. Uh, great stuff as always. Come back. We'll I'll post uh, post this in probably an hour or two, so we'll have it up. Uh, come back next Monday and join us for a recap of the week. As always, thanks for joining the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast.